what is it that I personally can do to prevent the climate crisis? I still ask myself this question today, but I also asked myself this question six years ago. And I wasn't really interested in cycling more or avoid eating meat. I was interested in the I personally part. Well, we have to start with that. And I'm an engineer. To be precise, I'm a mechanical engineer. So let's work with that. There has to be something in it, right? Apart from not sleeping. This big chunk, this big blue chunk, is the amount of energy that manufacturing uses. You see, it's pretty huge. So the energy we, as humans on this world, is largely composed of manufacturing. Well, that's a lucky coincidence. I'm a mechanical engineer. Manufacturing is close to my heart. Let's work with that, because if we reduce that, we can also reduce the CO2 emissions that come from converting this amount of energy. We imagine factories, this manufacturing part, to look a bit like that. Robots everywhere, exchanging data, hardly any humans. And even though that's not completely true, the data part is actually something that we can work with. That's a resource. We all know that there's knowledge hidden inside of data. We, we all know those social media platforms that basically have their whole business model set on top of data. So I'm not talking about this kind of future. I'm not talking about AIs that are machine gods and tell us when to produce what and do it as efficient as possible. I'm not into that. I'm more into the let's learn something from data part. And for that, I want to give you a picture. It's a much nicer picture than the one before. And that's an interview. And an interview to me is a very good way to approach how we can convert data to knowledge. A person asks a question, the other person reacts, emits data, and then the person asking the question maybe finds somewhere in there the answer to the question. So three steps, pretty easy, right? Formulate the question, gather the data, and answer the question. Boom, we have knowledge. Well, in modern data science, it's even better than that, because we don't need to ask, to ask the question. We have, if we want to continue with the picture, a huge load of records of all the people in the past talking about all kinds of things. And we only need to become really, really good at listening to all these records. And then, no matter what our question is, somewhere in there, the answers are hidden. And this is what social media platforms, online retailers, all those cool Silicon Valley companies do. So I'm not a social media person. Again, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm interested in machines. How does that look in my world? Let me introduce you to a machine. And this machine is a chiller. A chiller looks like that. It's pretty huge, and it's pretty simple. It's like the fridge you all have at home, but larger. It takes electric energy and converts it so that it produces cold water. This cold water is used, for example, in the semiconductor industry or also to operate air conditioning systems. It's a pretty important machine. And it doesn't only produce cold water, it also produces data. In my case, data is temperatures, electrical power, thermal power, physical quantities, and those are measured all the time. So why am I showing you this? I'm interested in how those machines work, because if I can find out how they work, I can only use them when they work good. To some extent, they're like people. Bear with me here. Again, I'm a mechanical engineer. This might sound weird to you, but it still is like that. Some people like hot weather. They work in hot conditions, they like that, they thrive in that kind of conditions. Others like cold weather. They thrive in snow, snowboarding all the time. And then there is a third type, and also fourth and fifth type. Third type is not caring about weather altogether that much, never really working at all. So, as I said, the same somehow is true for chillers. And even though we can talk to them, we can take the data that they produce and learn what kind of personality they have. That looks like this. And don't be intimidated. It's actually not too complicated. It's just a mathematical function drawn. And this thing describes how a given chiller reacts for certain different conditions. So if you give it cold or hot water, 
it reacts by providing more or less cooling energy using the same amount of electric energy. To make it simpler, it tells you when a given chiller works good or bad. And I did exactly that for a bunch of chillers in a factory. And now that I understood how they all worked, I was really good at for every day deciding which to switch on and which not to switch on. So every day, only those that performed the best had to be um, operated. And using this for a given facility, I came up with quite significant savings. 7,800 tons of CO2. That's a lot. Let me tell you, it's not the world, but it's a lot. Especially when you consider we didn't have to change any hardware. We didn't have to throw out the old machines and buy completely new ones. It's just using what we already had, but more efficiently. Also, that translates to quite an economic impact. 250,000 euros a year, just like the number before. Every year, savings only in energy costs. And energy costs today, as I'm speaking, are very, very low. Much lower than I would expect it to be, considering the climate crisis. But 250,000 euros already is quite a bit. So why am I not a rich man yet? I mean, from that you could make quite a nice business. Well, we also had to spend 5,000 hours to come up with that result. And 5,000 hours would be OK. It's still 50 euros per hour that you spend. But what makes it worse is it were 5,000 hours of agony. We had to sit in front of data coming from sensors, and this was just not, it didn't feel right. It was painful for everybody. It was painful for me as a PhD student, but more importantly, it was painful for those in the, in the factory that I was working with who don't have any spare time at all. So that's not feasible. We need to reduce that number. So next thing I had to come up with is a reason why it is like that. Let's remember these three steps that I showed you. Formulate the question, gather the data, and answer the question. Well, uh, I also showed you this nice picture of an interview. However, in reality, it looks a bit more like this. You ask a question, and then things happen. <laughs> you receive signals, and you can't really make out whether or not these signals come from your question or just ha had been produced anyways. And there's hardly a chance that you can make out the part that is actually useful for you. And this is exactly how it felt to work with the sensor data. So I spent most of my time, or we spent most of our time, gathering data. And that's not fun. It's actually really, really bad to do that, especially if you're a mechanical engineer. Again, this is what we were trained to do. This is what we want to do. We want to get our hands dirty. We want to work with machines, understand them, touch them, and build them. We also are trained to do stuff like that. So at university, we learn this stuff, and we can, on paper, calculate stuff. Calculate the measurements of a new machine or process whether or not an old machine works good or bad. But what we're not good at is this. This doesn't only look ugly to you. It also looks ugly to me. And I was the person producing that kind of stuff. This is code. It's Python, by the way. Uh, it's the only thing that I was able to learn after my studies. And I had to learn it because sensors do not talk in a language that I could understand. So I had to learn how to process it. And it felt wrong. Again, I had the luxury to be studying at university quite some time. And in reality, that's not the case. So my colleagues at the factory also have the same kind of problem, that, but they cannot learn that. So what they end up doing is this. And Microsoft Excel is a nice tool if you want to do table calculations, but it's certainly not uh, the right tool for anything else. And it also is certainly not the right kind of tool to process sensor data. And they knew that, and they felt it every day. And I was forcing them to still continue doing it because we were in a research project, right? So I've been talking quite a bit now about what we don't have and what the problems are. But I'm interested in a solution. And I try to find out how to approach this problem. So let's work with what we already have. Again, mechanical engineers, what do they have? They know their stuff. They have domain knowledge quite a bit. I mean, if you want to understand how a chiller works, who are you going to call? Mechanical engineer. <laughs> we know that temperatures 
influence how a chiller works. That's a, that's an, a valuable piece of knowledge right there. Also, and you wouldn't expect that, we are quite curious. We want to understand stuff. Maybe not like a child, but when you see a mechanical engineer in front of a machine, you will see almost a child. So we are curious, we want to understand things. And we are creative. So as soon as we understood the system that we are in charge of, as soon as we have everything that we need to know, we are also pretty good at coming up with solutions to make it work more efficiently. So we need to concentrate on that and not concentrate on what we're really bad at. So we need this process, I'm going to show it to you a last time, to look more like that. Because those two parts, formulating a question and answering a question, are the parts that we are really good at, that we also enjoy. And those are also the parts of the process that generate real value, not gathering data. So what am I leaving you with? Does anybody still remember the question that I answered, uh, that, I, that I asked in the beginning of my talk? Probably not. I hardly remember, remember it. It was, what can I personally do to prevent the climate crisis? The answer to that question was, six years ago, become really good at processing data. Today, having learned all that stuff, it's something else. It's enabling people to use what they already have really well their creativity, their curiosity, and their domain knowledge. But this problem, the problem of those, old, those poor data analyzing mechanical engineers doing what they're not good at, we all share that problem to some extent. When you come to think of it, we all have an abundance of data available for us every day. There's so much more data available to us than we can actually process. And it's so much data, just like this talk, bombarding us all the time with things we need to know, supposedly, that we tend to forget the question. So the next time you feel yourself overwhelmed by data, maybe just take one or even two steps back and try to think about the question you had in mind. So stay safe and stay curious. Thank you. <laughs>